Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga series. We are on the episode 19. We have already covered the life and yoga, the first chapter, the three steps of nature, the second chapter, threefold life, the third chapter. I highly recommend that you keep the text with you in case if you don't have, see the link below in the description that will give you the soft copy link. It's great to follow with the text so that you understand the rhythm and structure of Sri Aurobindo's writings. It's highly recommended. So let's begin. The systems of yoga. These relations between the different psychological divisions of the human being and these various utilities and objects of effort founded on them, such as we have seen them in our brief survey of the natural evolution, we shall find repeated in the fundamental principles and methods of the different schools of yoga. That's the first line, first paragraph. Let's unpack this. These relations between the different psychological divisions of the human being. He is referring to the divisions, the classification he brought in in the previous chapters. We know that the three steps of nature, the three evolutionary steps, there was also this clear underlying distinction between the sthula sharira, sukshma sharira, and karana sharira. Sthula sharira is our gross body and bodily life, where matter and life is well established. Then sukshma sharira is the subtle body, the inner mental body, and its subdivisions. Then there is Karana Sharira, the causal body. That's one of the divisions he has given. There is another division that he has given, which is individual, universal, and transcendental. Transcendent. So these two frameworks we will see running across. So he is referring back to these divisions. These relations between the different psychological divisions of the human being. Relations. So these divisions and these different layers and levels of the bodies, there is a relationship between them, interaction between them. And he has already explained, it is the sthula sharira, which is composed of the two layers, the material and vital layers, the most difficult to transform. And that is also the seat of our conservative inertia and resistance to change. And the subtle body, that's where the progressive mind is coming in. And in the causal body, that's where the spiritual dimension come in. And there is an interplay between the three and uh, he elaborated these interplay in the previous two chapters and how it manifests in the individual life, in the collective life, in the social development. So these relations between the different psychological divisions of the human being and these various utilities and objects of effort founded on them. So for each division, each part of our being, there is a corresponding utility in the evolutionary journey. So these various utilities and objects of effort founded on them, our individual effort and the yogic efforts, effort to evolve, all that are based on these divisions. So these various utilities and objects of effort founded on them such as we have seen them in our brief survey of the natural evolution. So that brief survey, 
we can see he touched upon them in the very first chapter where he referred to the hatha yoga the raja yoga the jnana yoga bhakti yoga and karma yoga and how they relate to these psychological parts and utilize some of their efforts or some of their aspects some of their strength and objects of yoga arising out of it so he briefly touched upon them in the first chapter and then elaborated some of them at a broad level in the second and third chapter so these various utilities and objects of effort founded on them such as we have seen them in our brief survey of the natural evolution we shall find repeated in the fundamental principles and methods of the different schools of yoga so he is gradually coming to the different schools of yoga that emerged in india over thousands of years and specialized into various specific focused effort and they are to come together and synthesize that is our whole journey in this book these schools have used some of these parts these psychological divisions and their specific strength as part of their yogic method and object of yoga so we find them repeated in the fundamental principles and methods of different schools of yoga it's not only repeated in the schools and their method it is also repeated in the social development individual development everywhere this three steps of nature this is nature's way of working that finds its reflection in the yogic schools as well as our individual personal development as well as social development so let me read this line one line once again these relations between the different psychological divisions of the human being and these various utilities and objects of effort founded on them such as we have seen them in our brief survey of the natural evolution we shall find repeated in the fundamental principles and methods of the different schools of yoga next line and if we seek to combine and harmonize their central practices and their predominant aims we shall find that the basis provided by nature is still our natural basis and the condition of their synthesis nature has already provided us a framework in her three steps that she has already established she has been elaborated it these three steps and these psychological divisions are the natural framework the natural foundation if we are to synthesize the schools of yoga not only their aim but also the means of progress so if we seek to combine and harmonize their central practices this is very important central practices every school of yoga you will find elaborate details of yogic practices behind them there is central principle and central objective of yoga that is what we need to touch upon removing all the nuanced details of the process we need to go to the central practices combine and harmonize their central practices and their predominant aims so practices and aims we shall find that the basis provided by nature is still our natural basis and the condition of their synthesis so this framework also provides the condition for the synthesis of various schools of yoga their central principles their central objective 
all that will come together naturally when we utilize the framework provided by nature and her evolution. The next paragraph. In one respect, yoga exceeds the normal operations of cosmic nature and climbs beyond her. Very interesting line. Often we consider it is all about becoming one with nature and following the rhythms and harmony of nature. Here he is saying, yoga exceeds the normal operation of cosmic nature, the manifest cosmic nature, and climbs beyond her. How does yoga climb beyond even the cosmic nature? This is where that three division Sri Aurobindo has given the individual, universal and transcendent come into the picture. That which is beyond the manifest world, the manifest nature, the timeless existence. So yoga transcends even the individual, it transcends even the universal and can reach transcendent. So it's not only embracing nature, eventually gives the possibility of transcending the normal operations of nature. So, let me read again. In one respect, yoga exceeds the normal operation of cosmic nature and climbs beyond her. For the aim of the universal mother is to embrace the divine in her own play and creations and there to realize it. So here is bringing in two key players of yoga. One is the universal mother, other is the divine. Now these are two voices of the divine we can say. For the aim of the universal mother is to embrace the divine. Universal mother, the universal shakti, universal energy presiding over the manifestation, pushing the evolution and working through every tiny little particle and every collective movement, the entire nature pushing things to evolve. There is this immense all-embracing universal mother's love and wisdom guiding the evolutionary process. And her aim is, the aim of the universal mother is to embrace the divine. Divine that even transcending the manifest nature. That is what we refer to as the supreme, who is beyond form, beyond time, beyond space, transcendent. So the aim of the universal mother is to embrace the divine in her own play and creations. So she has manifested this entire world. It is her creative play. It is to embrace the divine in her own play. So universal mother, her aim is to embrace the divine in her own play, not only in the transcendent, but also in her own play, in her own play and creations, and there to realize it. So on one hand, there is a climbing above the forms into the transcendent. The other is really to coming down and embrace the play of creation and realize the divine in the manifest world. And this is something very unique aspect that Sri Aurobindo is especially bringing in. Various schools of yoga talks about transcending the manifest world 
and merge into the divine. Here, Sri Aurobindo is bringing in the aim of the universal mother is to embrace the divine in her own play and creations and here to realize it. But in the highest flights of yoga, she reaches beyond herself in the and realizes the divine in itself, exceeding the universe and even standing apart from the cosmic play. So this is one of the possibility of yoga, that is, the highest flights of yoga, she reaches beyond herself. So the divine nature, she transcends herself, goes beyond herself and reaches the divine in itself, beyond into that formless, exceeding the universe and even standing apart from the cosmic plane exceeding the universe and standing apart from the cosmic play. So the manifest cosmos is seen as a play. Divine Mother is creating the manifest world and it is a play. And yoga can help us to even transcend the universal and transcend nature that is a possibility. So in the highest flights of yoga, she reaches beyond herself and realizes the divine in itself, exceeding the universe and even standing apart from the cosmic play. Therefore, by some, it is supposed that this is not only the highest, but also the one true and exclusively preferred, preferable object of yoga. So this has been one of the fundamental limitation or error Sri Aurobindo is bringing repeatedly into focus. Because yoga gives the possibility of transcending the manifest world, into the unmanifest, beyond time and space, beyond birth. Therefore, some of the schools of yoga makes it the one and only object of yoga. Not only the highest, but this is the object of yoga. Let's read that once again. Therefore, by some, it is supposed that this is not only the highest, but also the one true or exclusively preferable object of yoga. So we can come across various yogic schools talking about you don't exist as an isolate, a separate individual. There is only that which is real. Everything is unreal. You were never born. You never died. This whole play is nothing but an illusion. So that's a reflection of this particular objective many schools set for themselves. It is that which transcends the universe that is the only aim and worthy object and it is the highest and that's the very object of yoga. To reach that, merge into that, to dissolve in that and end the cycle of rebirth, end this illusion and entrapment in the manifest world. So, Therefore, by some it is supposed that this is the only, this is not only the highest, but also, but also the one true or exclusively preferable object of yoga. Yet, it is always through something which she has formed in her evolution that nature thus overpasses her evolution. Very interesting line here. It is always through something which she has formed in her evolution. We have seen the three steps of the evolution. 
she has already formed and established the bodily life, then there is the progressive mind, and there is a, beyond that the spiritual dimension. So she has already established these layers and it is always through something which she has formed in her evolution. So this is she has already formed and it is using that nature thus overpasses her evolution. So we can use what has already been established in nature to transcend the nature and transcend these steps of evolution that is already put in place by nature. So yet it is always through something which she has formed in her evolution that nature thus overpasses her evolution. One can take off into the highest domain beyond time and space from any of the already established steps of nature. Even from the Sthula Sharira and its established forms, it is possible to transcend the evolution and go beyond the creation or the subtle body. You can take off from there to the transcendent. These possibilities exist. So, Yet it is always through something which, is, which she has formed in her evolution that nature thus overpasses her evolution. It is the individual heart that by sublimating its highest and purest emotions attains to the transcendent bliss or the ineffable nirvana. The individual mind that by converting its ordinary functions into a knowledge beyond mentality, knows its oneness with the ineffable and merges its separate existence in that transcendent unity. So it's possible to take our heart and its emotions and use that as a pathway to ascend and go beyond the manifest world into the merging with the bliss that transcends the world, the universe. Similarly, the mind can use its ordinary functions and ordinary way of living, ordinary operations of mind, thought, imagination, etc. It is possible to use that as a means and then transcend it into the ineffable, that which is beyond time and space, and merge into that and unite with that. Let's read this line again. It is the individual heart that by sublimating its highest and purest emotions, our individual heart can sublimate our emotions. We can make our emotions sublime, refined through the adoration, the bhakti, the devotion, and ascend, attains to the transcendent bliss or the ineffable nirvana. Going to that state is possible through the heart and its emotions by making them sublime and refined. Or the ineffable nirvana, the individual mind that by converting its ordinary functions into a knowledge beyond mentality. So in yoga, we learn to transcend the normal understanding, the mental understanding. Our mind has a very limited knowledge about the world. It is possible to go beyond that limited knowledge and arrive at knowledge beyond mentality. Knows its oneness with the ineffable and merges with its separate existence, separate existence of the individual merging with the universal and transcendent in that transcendent unity, going beyond the universal into the transcendent, into that unity. That is a possibility. From any of these parts, it is possible to take off. And always it is the individual, the self conditioned in its experience by nature, and working through her formations that attains to the self unconditioned 
free and transcendent. So we have two voices of the self. One is our individual self conditions and bound by the nature. The other is the unconditioned nature beyond time and space, transcendent self, unborn, eternal self. These are two poises of the self. So always it is the individual, the self conditioned in its experience by nature. The self conditioned in its experience by nature. It is nature and her molds and those experiences that conditions and limits and binds the self into a tiny little mold. It is that individual and working through her formations that attains to the self unconditioned. So this individual self working through nature's formations from its state of being conditioned and limited eventually breaks through and arrive at unconditioned self. So there is a conditioned self, there is an unconditioned, unbound, infinite, eternal self. So that is free and transcendent. Let me read this line again. And always it is the individual, the self, conditioned in its experience by nature and working through her formations that attains to the self unconditioned, free, and transcendent. In practice, three conceptions are necessary before there can be any possibility of yoga. There must be, as it were, three consenting parties to the effort. God, nature, and the human soul. Or more abstract language, in a more abstract language, the transcendental, the universal, and the individual. That's the first line of our fourth paragraph. This framework three parties and their consent is central, key to all parts of yoga. One is our individual self, individual existence, then there is a universal existence and there is a transcendent. These three need to have that consent relationship. It is the same Sri Aurobindo refer using three other words, which is God, nature, and human soul. God is corresponding to the transcendent. Nature is corresponding to the universal. And human soul corresponding to the individual. So when the human soul, nature, and God come together, it is their coming together. This is the key to yoga. So in practice, three conceptions are necessary before there can be any possibility of yoga. So for the yoga to happen, these three conceptions are necessary. Three conceptions are necessary before there can be any possibility of yoga. There must be, as it were, three consenting parties to the effort. Very interesting line. Three consenting parties to the effort. So, what is emerging in this picture is that effort is not just we, the individual human beings, effort. There are three consenting parties involved in it. But in our normal conception about yoga, our experience and our notion and our perception is that I, this little individual, this little human being, is the only party who is involved in the effort of yoga. And Sri Aurobindo is giving a very different picture here. Three consenting parties. God, nature and human soul. So there is a, an effort of nature 
and there is an effort of God. Very, very fascinating picture here. And we are not aware of the effort of nature, nor are we aware of the effort of the God, or the transcendent, or the universal. We are aware of the individual. So here is the abstract, he says, in a more abstract language, the transcendent, uni the universal, and the individual. Next line. If the individual and nature are left to themselves, the one is bound to the other and unable to exceed appreciably her lingering march. Remember, on one hand, there is the yoga of nature, which is a subconscious yoga of nature, which is a lingering march. It's a very slow process of evolution. Modern science has already mapped millions and millions of years of evolution of life on Earth. And how slow that process is, it's a very lingering march. That is the yoga of nature, subconscious yoga of nature. If the individual and nature are left to themselves, so it is in nature, nature that is evolving so slow, it is in that nature the self-aware individual is emerging and becoming conscious and picking up the forces of nature to evolve. If the, this individual and nature are left to themselves without the third element, which is the God, which is the transcendent, if they are left to themselves, are unable to exceed appreciably and Okay, let me read once again. If the individual and nature are left to themselves, the one is bound to the other. So the individual is bound to nature and nature is bound to the individual because nature uses the individual as a means to her own progress and you, individual uses nature as a means to individual's progress. One is bound to the other and unable to exceed appreciably her lingering march because the individual is within the larger context of nature and cannot really exceed. And that is the issue. It cannot appreciably exceed, unable to exceed appreciably her lingering march. Something transcendent is needed, free from her and greater, which will act upon us and her attracting us upward to itself. He is using the word it to refer to the transcendent or God. Attracting us upward to itself and securing from her by good grace or by force her consent to the individual ascension. Another amazing picture that is emerging. So there is manifest nature and her subconscious yoga unfolding in which an individual is waking up to the possibility of yoga and taking up the forces of nature, psychological forces of nature, concentrating and trying to ascend. But the larger nature will bind the individual back to herself will not allow the individual to transcend. And that transcending requires the grace of the transcendent or the divine or it. So something transcendent is needed, free from her and greater. Greater here in the sense, beyond the manifest world, there is a existence transcending the manifest world free from her and greater, which will act upon us and her. So the transcendent is acting upon the individual and the universal nature. Act upon us and her, 
attracting us upward to itself. So the individual is attracted and drawn into the transcendent by the transcendent and securing from her by good grace or by force her consent to the individual ascension. So the ascension of the individual to the transcendent can be done only by a consent by the universal nature. Universal nature has to give consent for the individual to transcend her into the transcendent levels of existence. And that process is aided by the transcendent itself, by its grace or its force acting in the universal nature. Transcendent can act in the universal or in the individual. It has that freedom to act. Therefore, it brings these two parties to consent by its grace or by its universe, by its transcendent force pressing upon the universal nature, asking the nature, allow this individual, let this individual to ascend into the transcendent. So that is why these three consenting parties are required. The individual putting the effort to ascend and the transcendent bringing the grace and attracting the individual and the universal nature allowing the individual to ascend into the transcendent. In the universal nature, through her lingering march over her years and millions and millions of years, shaped the individual, made the individual self-aware. And now the individual is beginning the journey. And that journey requires the transcendent and the grace of the transcendent and the force of the transcendent to get the consent from the universal nature. Very beautiful picture we are getting here. Something transcendent is needed, free from her and greater, which will act upon us and her, attracting us upward to itself and securing from her by good grace or by force her consent to the individual ascension. It is this truth which makes necessary to every philosophy of yoga the conception of the Ishara, the Lord, Supreme Soul or Supreme Self, towards whom the effort is directed and who gives the illuminating touch and the strength to attain. So this is a central, deeper truth that we may not be aware of. And it is because of this truth which we need to acknowledge. Therefore, all schools of yoga acknowledges the existence of that transcendent expressed through various vocabulary, whether you call it Ishwara, Lord, Supreme Soul or Supreme Self. We see many ways Indian yogic schools expressing this transcendent. So in India, you will find a lot of words, Paramatman, Paramapurusha, Purushottama, all kinds of words used to represent that which is transcendent. And acknowledging that, recognizing that, and its role and its grace necessary for the ascension of the individual, it is always recognized by all the schools of yoga. And you will find this framework everywhere across the schools. So it is this truth which makes necessary to every philosophy of yoga the conception of the Ishwara, Lord, Supreme Soul or Supreme Self, towards whom effort is directed. The effort of yoga is directed towards that which is transcendent, the God, the Supreme Self. And who gives the illuminating touch and the strength to attain? Very important detail here. It is not our effort alone that can 
help us to ascend. The illuminating touch and grace from above is required. Therefore, this has been recognized by all the philosophy, all the schools of yoga. The effort is directed and who gives the illumination and touch and the strength to attain. So it is this truth which makes necessary to every philosophy of yoga the conception of the Ishura, Lord, Supreme Soul or Supreme Self towards whom the effort is directed and who gives the illuminating touch and the strength to attain. We cannot attain by our own strength. The transcendent, the grace of the transcendent, the grace of God is necessary. Equally true is the complementary idea so often enforced by the yoga of devotion that as the transcendent is necessary to the individual and sought after by him, so also the individual is necessary in a sense to the transcendent and sought after by it. If the bhakta seeks and yearns after Bhagavan, Bhagavan also seeks and yearns after the bhakta. This is a, an incredibly beautiful experience and realization and picture given particularly in the schools that follow the path of love and devotion where it is repeatedly insisted that it is not only that the individual is yearning after the God, after the divine, after the transcendent, it is also the divine the transcendent is also yearning and seeking the individual down here in this material universe so that through the individual, the divine can express in the manifest world. So there is a mutual relationship. There is a yearning towards each other. So the divine seeks the individual as much as the individual seeks the divine. There is these are like two poles of one being, being drawn to each other. Individual by the nature, there is this deep impulsion to seek that which is supreme. And supreme is seeking the individual. It's very, very nourishing to the soul even to hear that, to know that the divine seeks you. And various reflections, you can see as much as the disciple seeks the master, master is also seeking the disciple to whom the teaching can be given and the transmission across the lineage can happen. So it reflects across in our daily human life, eventually it translates as the individual seeking the ideal partner. There is a a tiny little grain of the universal truth. The divine is seeking you as much as you are seeking the divine. But when we seek, we often do not realize that we are seeking the divine. We seek in our normal human way, the limited mold and possibilities and limited windows through which we seek our human relationships. But at a deep depth, it is really seeking that which is the supreme. Delight, supreme beauty, supreme ananda. That's what the individual seeks. So equally true is the complementary idea so often enforced by yoga of devotion that the transcendent, as the transcendent is necessary to the individual and sought after by him, so also the individual is necessary in a sense to the transcendent and sought after by it. If the bhakta seeks and yearns after Bhagavan, bhakta is the devotee, Bhagavan is the Lord, the master. Bhagavan also seeks and yearns after the bhakta. The divine seeks the individual. There can be no yoga of knowledge without a human seeker of knowledge the supreme subject of knowledge and the divine use by the individual of the universal faculties of knowledge. 
no yoga of devotion without the human god lover the supreme object of love and delight and the divine use by the individual of the universal faculties of spiritual emotional and aesthetic enjoyment no yoga of works without the human worker the supreme will master of all work works and sacrifices and the divine use of the individual of the universal faculties of power and action wow that's a long sentence it uh, it's very structural if you look at it he is repeating a pattern across three different domains in the domain of love and devotion in the domain of knowledge in the domain of action which is corresponding to yoga of love yoga of knowledge yoga of action and in each one there is the let's go one by one there can be no yoga of knowledge yoga of knowledge that's the first part that he is taking up without a human seeker of knowledge so there is the individual who is seeking we can enter the path through knowledge we can enter through love we can enter through will the action so here he is referring to the seeker who is entering through the path of knowledge so there is a human individual seeker of knowledge a human seeker of knowledge so that's one part of the story supreme subject of knowledge there is this beautiful question from the upanishads which asks by knowing all this what is it that you what that is coming to be known it is that supreme existence supreme divine so the whole object of knowledge is to know the divine normally knowledge when we say a scientific pursuit of truth for example is seeking the truth of the material nature nature's processes what is already established by the universal nature and that is what science and objective methodological research finds the material processes of nature whereas the yogic seeker is not seeking the material processes of nature even when the yogic process seeks it it is the divine knowledge operating through that the divine existence operating in nature that one is seeking and the supreme object of knowledge is that which transcends nature the divine in itself the transcendent in itself is sought by the seeker of knowledge so a, a human seeker of knowledge the supreme subject of knowledge and the divine use by the individual of the universal faculties of knowledge there is the universal faculty of knowledge there is our limited faculty of knowledge our human little mind that is our tiny little mold and its rational intelligence and its senses and there's a bound tiny window in which it operates tiny little room in which it operates when the seeker of knowledge transcends this limitation this boundaries then you are entering into a universal faculty of knowledge that corresponds to the transcendental existence or the universal existence and there is a divine use of these faculties that is the possibility when you enter through path of knowledge so there is three things here one is the seeker of knowledge object of knowledge and then there is a divine use of the universal faculties of knowledge so that is within the knowledge domain now he moves on to the yoga of devotion no yoga of devotion without the human god lover that is first part the supreme object of love and delight so for a lover there is an object of love and delight which is the beloved the divine so in object of in the path of devotion there is the form of the divine that is worshiped it is that intimacy with the divine that is sought after so there is the human god lover the supreme object of love and delight 
and the divine use by the individual of the universal faculties of spiritual, emotional and aesthetic enjoyment. So in the path of yoga or that follows the path of emotions and heart, there is an embracing of the aesthetics, the beauty, that's why you see beautiful rituals and ceremonies and art and literature and culture and all the celebration of the divine through arts, you will find in the yoga of devotion. Universal faculties of spiritual, emotional and aesthetic enjoyment. This dimension of enjoyment is very deeply infused in the path of yoga. You will not find that in the path of knowledge, where it, there is a delight of knowledge, whereas in this here, there is this aesthetic enjoyment of this universal faculty of all beautiful, the whole world you begin to perceive as nothing but the divine manifest in all innumerable ways, all beautiful. In every action in the world, you see the divine presence dwelling behind. The perception of the all beautiful is part of the yoga of devotion. Here again, there are these three aspects, the God lover who seeks and the supreme object, which is the divine beloved and the universal, the divine used by the individual of this universal faculties. Then the third is referring to no yoga of works without the human worker, the supreme will, master of all works and sacrifices and the divine use of the individual of the universal faculties of power and action. So in Karma Yoga, Yoga of works, there is a human worker who is the instrument. Then there is a supreme will to which the universe, the individual will is getting aligned, who is the supreme will, is will of the master, master of all works and sacrifices, and the divine used by the individual of the fact, universal faculties of power and action. So in Karma Yoga comes the possibility of the universal power of action. In yoga of knowledge, there is a universal faculty of knowing. In the yoga of love and devotion, there is a universal faculty of enjoyment. In the yoga of works, in karma yoga, you arrive at a universal faculty of action. Universal faculties of power and action in the world. <clears throat> so that's the three layered uh, sentence. It's a long sentence referring to all three paths in one breath of inspiration in a rhythmic way. Let's read this line the way he has written it. It's a flow of inspired seeing across the layers. There can be no yoga of knowledge without a human seeker of the knowledge, the supreme subject of knowledge and the divine use by the individual of the universal faculties of knowledge. No yoga of devotion without the supreme God lover, the supreme object of love and delight, and the divine use by the individual of the universal faculties of spiritual, emotional, and aesthetic enjoyment. No yoga of works without the human worker, the supreme will, master of all works and sacrifices, and the divine use by the individual of the universal faculties of power and action. Wow, what a flow. That's the uh, beauty of Sri Aurobindo's writing. Even if they are long lines, within them there is a rhythm, there is a structure, there is a pattern. Because there is a yogic vision of a larger picture in which he is giving the broad lines within every cycle there is a subset of details that recurs and uh, therefore when we read him and feel his rhythm and flow and force and through that this recursive rhythm establishes their rhythm and structure and repatterns our brain 
and restructures our mind and our cognitive possibilities, he pushes us beyond our limitations. And our mind expands, widens, and begins to see and appreciate big picture. And at the same time, recursively zooming into any level of micro detail. However monistic may be our intellectual conception of the highest truth of things, in practice we are compelled to accept this omnipresent trinity. Monistic, monism, that is seeing the reality as one. One consciousness, one existence. Now, intellectual conception of the highest truth of things. When various schools of yoga intellectually conceive the highest truth, always it will point towards oneness, one existence, often conceived as the formless, timeless existence. That one, even when it is well acknowledged, well accepted, in practice, the trinity of the individual, the universal or trans and transcendent, or the human soul, the universal nature and God, this trinity will become, is impo uh, will become a central reference in all the schools of yoga. So he's saying here, however monistic may be our intellectual conception of the highest truth of things, in practice we are compelled to accept this omnipresent trinity. This trinity is omnipresent and we are compelled to accept it in all the schools of yoga or the pathways of yoga, these three things you will always find. For the contact of the human and individual consciousness with the divine is the very essence of yoga. Here is a very simple definition of yoga. It is the contact of the human and individual consciousness. We are humans and we have our individual consciousness. This consciousness having its contact with the divine is the very essence of yoga. Yoga is the union of that which has become separated in the play of the universe with its own true self, origin and universality. This is another beautiful definition of yoga. Yoga is the union of that which has become separated. So when in universal nature is manifesting the world in that individual is formed, in that process of formation, the individual gets separated from its source, its origin, its transcendent source. And this separated individual getting back to the contact with the source and union with the source, that's yoga. So yoga is the union of that which has become separated in the play of the universe. So the creation is seen as a play, in the play of the universe with its own true self. That individual self, its true self is that which is transcendent with its own true self, origin and universality. The contact may take place at any point of the complex and intricately organized consciousness, which we call our personality. Our human personality is complex. It is multi-layered, various parts that has been developed by evolution through its long journey. And any of these formations or the parts can be the point of contact with the source, with the divine. The contact may take place 
at any point of the complex and intricately organized consciousness which we call our personality. It may be affected in the physical through the body. So that's one possibility. The body itself can be the means of contact with the divine. It may be affected in the physical through the body. So in the physical contact can happen. In the vital, through the action of those functionings which determine the state and the experiences of our nervous being. So we are not only a material physical entity, there is a nervous being within us with its sensory response, reactions, all that sensual being within us, sensory being. This too can contact directly. I mean, it, this, pain, this can be the point of contact. So in the vital, through the action of those functionings which determine the state and the experiences of our nervous being. Through the mentality, whether by means of the emotional heart, the active will or the understanding mind, or more largely by a general conversion of the mental consciousness in all its activities. So the first two, the body and the uh, nervous being, that is part of the sthula sharira. Now he is coming to the sukshma, the mentality. Through the mentality, the progressive mind, whether by means of the emotional heart, our emotional being is very much mentalized emotional being. And this emotional being can direct, uh, can be the point of contact. Or the active will, our intelligent will can be the means and the point of contact. Or the understanding mind, our rational intelligence and its understanding, the way it understands, the knowledge, that can be the means of contact. Or more largely a general conversion of the mental consciousness in all its activities. The chitta vrittis of the mental consciousness, when that is brought into inner quietude, there can be a general contact from mental consciousness with the transcendent. So let me read this full line in one go. It may be affected in the physical through the body in the vital through the action of those functionings which determine the state and the experiences of our nervous being. Through the mentality, whether by means of the emotional heart, the active will or the understanding mind, or more largely by a general conversion of the mental consciousness in all its activities. It may equally be accomplished through a direct awakening to the universal or transcendent truth and bliss by the conversion of the central ego in the mind. Ego centered in the mind can directly contact the transcendent, the divine, without having to use other layers like the body, the nervous being, the emotional being, the will or the general understanding or mental consciousness. It can directly contact. The ego can directly contact. It may equally be accomplished through a direct awakening, a direct awakening to the universal or transcendent truth and bliss by the conversion of the central ego in the mind. It's very important to keep this in mind. It is possible for a direct contact by passing the rest. And according to the point of contact we choose will be the type of yoga that we practice. So each individual has certain preferred pathway of yoga, a point of contact made with the transcendent and according to the point of contact will be the type of yoga that will be chosen by that individual. And since there are multiple points of contact, therefore we have a multiplicity of paths, schools of yoga. 
in India. For if leaving aside the complexities of their peculiar processes, we fix our regard on the central principle of the chief schools of yoga still prevalent in India, we find that they arrange themselves in an ascending order which starts from the lowest rung of the ladder, the body, and ascends to the direct contact between the individual soul and the transcendent and universal self. So all the schools of yoga fall into a ladder, an ascending series. And this ladder will become visible when we put aside all the external hundreds of details of practices and look at the central principle of their method. Only when we look at the central principle, we discover that there is a natural ascending order starting from the body, ascending into the nervous being, into the emotional heart, into the will of the mind, or the understanding of the mind, or general consciousness of the mind, and to the ego of the mind. So there is a, an ascending order. And culminating in the soul, which can directly connect with the transcendent divine. So let me read that line again. For if leaving aside the complexities of their particular processes, the complexities of particular processes of specific schools, every school has its own particular set of practices. So we leave aside the complexities. We fix our regard on the central principle of the chief schools of yoga still prevalent in India. We find that they arrange themselves in an ascending order which starts from the lowest rung of the ladder, the body, and ascends to a direct contact between the individual soul and the transcendent and universal self. Important point for us is to remember that you can use the body as a means or other layers as a means. That's possible, but it is also possible a direct contact. The soul can contact directly the divine. Hatha Yoga selects the body and the vital functionings as its instrument of perfection and realization. Its concern is with the gross body. Hatha Yoga is the most popular known form of yoga, known for its postures, asanas. So Hatha Yoga selects the body and vital function. It also utilizes the breath, which is one of the chief operations of the vital energy, the breathing and the pranayama, the whole system of pranayama built on it. So asana pranayama together is part of Hatha Yoga. And Hatha Yoga selects the body and the vital functionings as its instruments of perfection and realization. Its concern is with the gross body. The Sthula Sharira is what Hatha Yoga utilizes as a point of contact with the transcendent. Raja Yoga selects the mental being in its different parts as its liver power. It concentrates on the subtle body. So there is, behind the gross body, there is a subtle body. And Raja Yoga utilizes the subtle body and various powers of the mind. So Raja Yoga selects the mental being in its different parts as its liver power. It concentrates on the subtle body. The triple path of works, of love, of knowledge, uses some part of the mental being, will, heart, or intellect as a starting point and seeks by its conversion to arrive at the liberating truth, beauty, and infinity, which are the nature of the spiritual life. Sri Aurobindo is putting together three paths. The path of knowledge, path of love, path of work, that is, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, and Karma Yoga. 
he is bringing them all together as a triple path that is utilizing some parts of the mental being again the subtle body one a use of will or heart or intellect will is used in the karma yoga heart and emotions is used in the bhakti yoga and intellect the, and its ability to know knowledge is for jnana yoga that as a starting point and seeks the seeks by its conversion to arrive at the liberating truth by conversion of the will emotion or the intellect conversion to arrive at the liberating truth beatitude and infinity which are the nature of the spiritual life so truth beatitude and infinity these are the very nature of spiritual life and triple path utilizes any of these faculties again it uses the subtle body to arrive at the spiritual life its method is a direct commerce between the human purusha in the individual body and the divine purusha who dwells in every body and yet transcends all form and name so the triple path uses a direct commerce it uses these faculties whether it is will emotions or intellect only as a starting point it uses them as a starting point and then goes to a direct contact so its method is a direct commerce between human purusha that is the human soul with the divine purusha who dwells in all the divine self who dwells in all that is manifest in the world not only it is in all things it also transcends all forms and name nama and rupa everything is transcended by that so its method is a direct commerce between the human purusha in the individual body and the divine purusha who dwells in every body and yet transcends all form and name so here we see the spectrum of the various schools and their diverse starting points and also a possibility of a direct contact an individual coming in contact with the transcendent that is the essence of yoga and because of the starting point differing starting from different parts of the being therefore different schools and in all that as we see shri arbindo referred to the trinity that is present in all these approaches there is individual universal and transcendent in another other words human soul the universal nature and god this trinity is present regardless of which school you look at and each school has its own starting point and the way it makes the contact this will become visible when we look at the central principles of any school of yoga so here he has laid out the broad view of how to look at these schools and we see them organizing themselves naturally into an ascending order which fits perfectly into the three steps of evolution nature has already established which has its gross body the subtle body and causal body so there is a clear natural framework for synthesizing yogic schools so with that we are coming to the end of this episode keep in touch and see you next wednesday thank you